So our next speaker is uh, Professor Jakob Dweck. Jakob Dweck is Associate Professor of History and Judaic Studies at Princeton University. His publications include the monograph, The Scandal of Kabbalah, Leon Modena, Jewish Mysticism, Early Modern Venice. It was published by Princeton University Press in 2011. It was a finalist for the 2012 Best First Book in the History of Religion Award from the American Academy of Religion. And it received an honorary mention for the 2014 Jordan Schnitzer Award in Medieval and Early Modern History from the Association for Jewish Studies. Professor Dweck is currently writing on Jacob Sospartos, the Sephardic rabbi who was the chief critic of the Messianic movement that coalesced around Shabtai Tzvi. He will speak today on Sefer Hasidim in early modern Europe. The title of my talk, like most titles, is inaccurate. <laughs> Separate Hasidim in early modern Europe could well be the subject of a separate conference in and of itself. Simply put, the subject is too broad, too diverse, and too difficult to cover in the time of a single presentation. I would like to make a simple suggestion at the outset. The appearance of Separate Hasidim as a printed book in Bologna in 1538 fundamentally changed the ways that the book had been read. The regnant mood in current scholarship is profoundly unsympathetic to the approach adopted by Elizabeth Eisenstein in her 1979 The Printing Press as an Agent of Change. I have learned much, and I will admit I have enjoyed, the scathing criticisms of Eisenstein's book. But the very fact that scholars as different as Adrian Johns, David McKittrick, and Anthony Grafton continue to criticize her book seemed to suggest that Professor Eisenstein was onto something. For our purposes over the next 20 minutes, I would like to suggest that the appearance of Sefer Hasidim in print, relatively early on in the 16th century, before the Zohar, before Sefer Yitzirah, and before Sefer Abahir, enabled the book to enter a corpus of literary texts that many readers deemed authoritative. Readers as different from one another as Isaac Kusavin in Jacobean England, Menashe ben Israel in the Dutch Jerusalem of 17th century Amsterdam, Moshe Chaim Mitzato in 18th century Padua, and Chaim Yusuf David Azulai in 18th century Bivorno, all turned to Sefer Hasidim as a source of rabbinic learning. Some of these men, and they were all men, wrote commentaries on the book. Thus, Sa'ad Yahal Avna in the 17th century wrote a commentary to the book, and Chaim Yusuf David Azulai a century later likewise composed a commentary on it entitled Brit Olam. Others, such as Isaac Kusavin, annotated their copies of the printed book, and, as Anthony Grafton and Joanna Weinberg discovered, his copy survives to this day in the British Library. Still others, such as Jacob Emden, turn to the book as a source of spiritual exercises, as he described it in his Megillah Sefer. One day, if I live long enough, I hope to write such a study, a study that would provide a typology of the different ways that intellectuals in early modern Europe read Sefer Hasidim, that splendid outburst of spirituality, in the inimitable words of the late and much lamented Elliot Horowitz. Some read the work extensively, others intensively, and still others superficially. I hope such a study might show that Sefer Hasidim became an integral part of the rabbinic corpus as readers domesticated and, and digested the book. The goal of such a study would be to produce something akin to James Hankin's typology of the different way that Plato was read in 15th century Italy in a book that he published some 27 years ago. But today, my goal is considerably narrower. I want to focus on a single reader at a single point in time who drew on a single passage of Sefer Hasidim in the midst of the bitter controversy, hence the misleading um, title that I have given you. The reader is Jacob Sasportas, born around the year 1610 in Oran, or Wahran in modern-day modern Algeria. But at the time of his birth, significantly at the presidio of the Spanish Habsburg Empire. Sasportas died in 1698, half a world away in northern Europe, in Amsterdam. The time is 1665-1666, at the height of the messianic enthusiasm over Shabtai Tzvi. The place is the Sephardic diaspora in northern Europe, specifically Hamburg and Amsterdam. And the passage is Sefer Hasidim Bologna, passage 206. But before I turn to Sasportas' citation of Sefer Chassidim, 
I have to provide some descriptive background of the Sabatian movement, as well as a discussion of Sasportas' reading of Maimonides. I hope to show that these are all linked to one another, but ultimately, that is for you to decide, and not me. One final note of introduction. I am very grateful to the organizers of this conference for allowing a student of early modern Europe to trespass on the hallowed ground of the Middle Ages. It is an honor for me to be here among such a distinguished group of scholars. A rabbi in, Western Sephardic, in the Western Sephardic diaspora, Sasportas emerged in 1665 as one of the few opponents to the Jewish Mishnah Messiah named Shabtai Tzvi. Jews everywhere from the eastern fringes of the Ottoman Empire to the European edges of the Atlantic Ocean greeted the news of redemption with uncritical enthusiasm. For the better part of the next year, until the Messiah converted to Islam at the behest of Mehmed IV in September 1666, Throngs of believers abjured the laws of Judaism and adhered to new norms established by the Messiah and his prophet, Nathan of Gaza. In his response to Sabatianism, Sasportas held up a series of texts as sources of authority to counter the immediate religious experiences of the Sabatians. He repeatedly emphasized an imperative to doubt, and he besieged the recipients of his letters to question the certainty of their messianic sensibility. Behind both the authority of these written works and his demand for skepticism was the law as the fundamental point of departure for all thinking about the Messiah. This stress on the law, which Sasportas held himself up as uniquely capable of interpreting, and from which he excluded almost anything but the written word as a possible source, went hand in hand with a deep-seated fear of the crowd. His appeal to legal expertise and pietist sensibility evolved in reaction to the expressions of mass enthusiasm and the public celebration of the Messiah's arrival. In his invocation of the authority of the written word, and in his denunciation of the Jewish crowd, Sasportas articulated a distinction between the lettered versus the unlettered that had a long afterlife in the early modern period. Sasportas developed this position, the imperative to doubt popular sentiment, the authority of the written word, the denigration of experience as a source of religious truth, and his fear of the crowd, only in response to the Sabatian theology articulated by Nathan of Gaza and other prophets. In a series of letters by Nathan of Gaza before the apostasy of Shabtai Tzvi, and by a number of other figures, such as Abraham Miguel Cardozo, subsequent to the Messiah's conversion, Sabatian prophets espoused a new conception of time. With the revelation of the Messiah in the form of Shabtai Tzvi, the redemption had begun. What exactly this redemption meant was the subject of fierce internecine dispute among the Sabatians particularly in the period after Shabtai's conversion. For some believers, this new sense of time was reflected in their approach to the calendar. Their letters bore the date of the first or the second year since the arrival of the Messiah. They addressed one another as if they were living in a new era. Yet for other figures, such as Rafael Tupino, a preacher and printer in Livorno, who corresponded with Sasportas, this new sense of time did not impinge upon his observance of the law. Tupino, and many believers like him, continued to observe the commandments as they had done before the arrival of the Messiah. For others, however, this new sense of time was, ac was accompanied by a radical reevaluation and restructuring of the legal norms that govern Jewish observance. This reordering took a number of forms, and developed gradually over the course of the roughly 16 months before Natan's declaration of Shabtai of the Messiah and the latter's conversion to Islam. It took on even more radical forms in the immediate aftermath of the conversion but the fundamental point of the enterprise is the same. In the period of the redemption, the law must lost much of its former social power. Or, if we read correctly, as I think, Maos Kahana's recent article in Zion, it's not clear what the law was. Sabatians jettisoned significant legal norms as a result of their experience of redemption. <clears throat> For the masses of Jews swept up by the charismatic authority of the leaders of their movement, the Sabatian prophet replaced the Talmudists as the source of communal authority. These prophets embraced the form of antinomianism that involved the reinterpretation of a celebrated rabbinic seri, a, a transgression committed for its own sake is greater than a commandment not committed for its own sake, which they construed as the abrogation of the law is its fulfillment. In light of the experience of redemption, days of mourning for the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, traditionally, traditionally observed with ascetic restraint and fasting, became days of joy, celebrated with food, drink, and general merriment. Shabtai Tzvi reintroduced the ritual slaughter of animals on Passover, a practice abolished with the invention of rabbinic Judaism in the wake of the temple destruction. 
Sabatians did not confine their innovations to the abrogation of the law. They introduced new liturgies into the daily service, and they transformed obscure rituals, such as the fourth meal at the conclusion of the Sabbath, into prolonged celebrations of their Messiah. At the same time, they engaged in a series of provocative sexual practices, including suspension of Jewish laws governing conjugal relations and the demand for sexual abstinence. This was the ultimate form of antinomianism, as it threatened the primary unit of all social discipline, then and now, the family. Sasportus drew most frequently on medieval rabbinic literature, rather than the Mishnah and the Talmud of antiquity. At the center of his anti-messianism and at the core of his accounts is the Mishneh Torah of Maimonides. Sasportus repeatedly drew upon the 14 books of the Code, especially his treatment of the Messianic age and the laws of kings at the conclusion of the Code's final volume, the Book of Judges. His dispute with the Sabatians, however, was not merely about the celebrated discussion of, of the Messiah in Maimonides' writing. Throughout Tzitzat Nobel the title Sasportus gave to his chronicle and compendium of the controversy, Sasportus reverted to passages scattered all over the code, including those concerning the laws of evidence, the laws of repentance, and the laws of prayer. If the Code of Maimonides is the primary point of departure for Sasportus' response, he drew on a number of other works by Maimonides to buttress his arguments. He engaged in a protracted dispute with the Sabatians and their moderate supporters, such as Isaac Abu de Fonseca, as to whether the Epistle to Yemen justified their belief or his skepticism. He obliquely referred to the guide of the perplexed in his definition of belief, and explicitly invoked it as a means to limit the scope of prophecy, and to exclude Nathan of Gaza and other Sabatians entirely from that category. In his reading, the guide of the perplexed offered a stinging rebuttal of all the would-be prophets who claimed direct communication with the divine, rather than the authorization to engage in prophetic speculation. He drew on the Book of Commandments in a protracted legal dispute about the recitation of the priestly blessing in the public synagogue service of the Jews of Amsterdam. From this array of sources, Sasportus conjured up a Maimonides, who is sober, rational, and definitive. The law, more than any other aspect of Judaism, was the point of departure, and the Telos were all thinking about the Messiah. Sasportus' Maimonides had counseled patience to the Jews of Yemen, and he sought to attenuate their false expectations of the advent of the Messiah in the middle of the 12th century. In his legal code, Maimonides had formulated a set of criteria that all but ensured that the laws of Judaism would continue to be authoritative in the Messianic age. In the words of Amos Hugenstein, the Messiah will not change an iota of the law. An antinomian attitude is the clearest indication of an imposter. Sasportas went to great lengths to convince his readers in the Western Sephardic diaspora that they had misconstrued Maimonides. But he also sought to construct an anti-Messianic tradition out of a number of medieval sources. As he had written to the Amsterdam Rabbinate, have you seen in a single book that one must believe in a Messiah about someone who says about himself, I am the Messiah? Sasportas seemed to prefer any book to the experiential evidence of the Sabathian. In a long letter, to the aforementioned Raphael Supino in Livorno, that marked the first sustained articulation of his opposition to Chateau II, Sasportas drew a path upon a passage in Sefer Chassidim. He advised Supino to turn to passage 206 in what we call the Bologna edition, he just called it Sefer Chassidim, which espoused the messianic pacifism at odds with the active campaigning of the Sabathians and their allies. And I'm going to read it in first in Hebrew and then in my English translation, and um, for um, all the experts in medieval Hebrew here, if I butcher this um, pronunciation, please tell me nicely afterwards. <laughs> um, this is the passage. If you are to be a bad man on Mashiach, that he has you asking the Masek Shafim or the Masek Shedim or the Masek Amitourash. And because they are the Malachim, the Malachim, the Malachim, they are saying to the Mashiach, that he will be able to live in the world, that he will be the Malachim. And in the end, he will be the Malachim to the world, that he will be the Malachim. או השדים באים ולומדים לו חשבונות וסודות לבושתו ולבושת המאמינים בדבריו. So this is my attempt at an English translation. If you see a man prophesizing about the Messiah, know that he is engaged in witchcraft or evil spirits as with the ineffable name. Angels will tell him false things about the Messiah so that he could be exposed to the world as a fraud. In the end, it shall be shame and embarrassment to the entire world that he has disturbed the angels. Or the demon will come and instruct him in calculations and secrets that will redound to his shame and to the shame of those who believe in his work. It would be 
too hard to imagine a medieval Jewish book further from Maimonides' code than Zephyr Chassidim, where Maimonides sought to compose a code that would represent the old Torah in its entirety. Zephyr Chassidim sought to codify the will of the Creator in a way that would define for the pietist precisely how to submit to the divine yoke. If Maimonides' code argues that the, advent, that the advent of the Messianic age would involve no change in the law, Sefer Chassidim argued that the pietist was in need of constant guidance that the traditional corpus of Jewish law could not provide. The Messianic state of perfection was a moral imperative that was before obtainable. Maimonides produced a normative legal guide for lay leadership. The German pietist wrote a work that taught the aspiring pietist how to transcend the law. Sesfordus mentioned this particular passage of Sefer Chassidim, and he cited it in its entirety on no fewer than five occasions in the Tzitzat Any source, no matter how far from his own intellectual universe, was preferable to the experiential claims made by the Sabatians about the arrival of redemption. He would choose messianic pacifism in any guide, even that of the, in any guise, even that of the supernatural, as long as it appeared in a written work that he could hold up as authoritative. Furthermore, it is conceivable that Sesfortas identified a conservative tendency in the world of the pietists that was the antithesis of Sabatian enthusiasm. I, I recognize I'm about to step on um, pretty um, uh, heavy trodden ground right now, and I'm, I, I come as a tourist in the 17th century, but this is what I have learned from the Second Death Literature. Um, as Chaim Salvation has shown, the pietists were fighting a rearguard conservative action against the rise of dialectical methods of Talmud play that came of age in 12th century France which prized intellectual speculation at the expense of legal and moral adjudication. I should say that I wrote that sentence before I heard such a talk today, so it could be that I'm wrong. But just for the sake of the next 12 minutes, can you bear with me? Thank you, Professor Thank you. The German pietists had to contend with the revolution in intellectual Jewish life that he defined the study of the Quran. And he responded with a novel form of piety that went beyond, far beyond the bounds of the law. Sesfortas faced a very different type of revolution in Jewish life a mass messianic movement, and he responded with a novel form of criticism that far exceeded the norms of rabbinic writing. For all of the differences between Sefer Chassidim and the writings of Maimonides, Sesfortas may have been attuned to affinity between the sources that have eluded modern fellowship. Both the pious of Sefer Chassidim and Maimonides were unabashed of leaders. Both placed enormous emphasis on the importance of the written work. Their elitism may have had different sources. Maimonides valued a certain type of philosophical contemplation completely far from the supernatural world of the German pietists. He put the spiritual use of reason at the center of his universe, rather than the will of the creator. The pietists, by contrast, idealized the model of the spiritual superman, and emphasized the rigors of physical discipline and penance. But both the pietists in Sefer Chassidim and Maimonides set themselves apart from their respective environments as morally corrupt and, perhaps, rendered degenerate by wrong-headed popular opinion. Sesfortas, too, cultivated the posture of the critic, and set himself apart from his addressees, who he held to have betrayed the Sephardic learned ideal in the name of which he now spoke. Okay, so that is a part about Sefer Chassidim and Shabtay Tzvi. What I want to do now is very briefly talk about one other source that Sesfortas um, cites in this context that's somewhat far away from both Sefer Chassidim and uh, Maimonides, but I think, I hope, it ties into the point I'm trying to make, which is effectively a footnote onto the work of Professor Alphonne Reiner, who was here a few minutes ago. <laughs> if Maimonides and Zephyr Chassidim anchored Sesfortas' anti-Messianism in the Jewish textual tradition, he turned to a third source to justify his skepticism of Sabatian prophecy, a legal response of, of the Iberian jurist Salman ibn Adret, who dies in 1310. I first met him as the Rashbab, but now he's Salman ibn Adret. <laughs> as Matt Goldis has shown, the possibility of reviving prophecy underlay many of the claims of authority made by the Sabatians. Nathan of Gaza and his fellow prophets invoked divine revelation as proof of their authority, and they sought to transform the charisma of learning that had long served to cement the alliance between the rabbinate and the lay oligarchy within Jewish communities. In a retort that paralleled his appeal to Maimonides in terms of his unbelief in the Messiah, Sesfortas turned to a medieval legal discussion of prophecy to justify his unbelief in the Messiah's prophet. Writing to Yosef Halevi in the Gordon, a preacher to the community of Sephardic Jews, who was, I think, Sesfortas' only friend in 1660, um, Sesfortas uh, pointedly invokes Ibn Adret. Sesfortas continued to cite Ibn Adret as justification for his skepticism, and he directed his addressee to examine the passage himself. In this response, Ibn Adret had skeptically addressed claims about a possible prophet in Avila. 
He informs his reader that while prophecy was a theoretical possibility, it could only happen to someone who was particularly pious and living in Palestine. <coughs> Ibn Adjet is doubtful that the particular man in question was the prophet that he claimed to be. Quote, but this shocked me that a man who was neither a sage nor knowledgeable about books, nor a servant to the sages, should be who they said he was. Like Sasporta, several hundred years later, Ibn Adret held up knowledge of written texts as a requirement for the attainment of a certain rank within the religious hierarchy. In this case, a prophet rather than a messiah. Elsewhere in his writings, both in Tzitzat of El Tzvi and in his collection of Responsa of Yaakov, Sasporta has turned to Ibn Adret as a legal precedent in his ruling. What is more, Sasportas felt an almost filial connection to him, as Ibn Adret had been a student of his ancestor, Nachmanides. <coughs> At one point, in the midst of a vituperative exchange with Yitzhak Nahar, his former student, Sasportas pointedly invoked the protective merit of Nachmanides and Ibn Adret in the very same breath. Now, the Rashba, or Solomon Ibn Adret, can hardly be construed as a late medieval Maimonidean, or as a German pietist. He belonged to a tradition of Sephardic jurisprudence that was adequately opposed to the philosophical rationalism of the guy, as well as to the exegetical supernaturalism of Sefer Hasidim. On a number of occasions in the second controversy surrounding the writings of Maimonides that dominated Jewish intellectual life in Provence and Catalonia at the turn of the 13th century, Ibn Adret had scathing things to say about the guy that was perplexed. Moreover, he appears to have been completely unaware of Sefer Hasidim, as recent scholarship has suggested that the work made few, if any, inroads into the Iberian Peninsula in the late Middle Ages. Please don't throw eggs at me. I get it. This is a massive scholarly argument about this. I don't know. I'm talking about the 17th century. <laughs> in addressing the Sabatians and their supporters, Sasportas thus constructed a textual anti-Messianic tradition out of sources that sat awkwardly next to one another on his imagined but also actual bookshelves. Nonetheless, he used them to draw out a number of points that he sought to impress upon his correspondence. First, he turned to the stipulations for the Messiah's arrival in Maimonides' code to caution his readers about their certainty. Second, he drew upon Maimonides and the German pietists to ask his readers to imagine the anarchy and disorder that would arise from the proliferation of Messiah. Finally, he drew upon Maimonides and Medadret to define prophecy in such a manner that would pointedly exclude Nathan, Nathan of God, excuse me, and his, and his colleagues from that category. Important as each of these individual claims was, the total impact of Sasportas' argument amounted to a demand for provisional skepticism in the face of experiential certainty. Authority manifested itself in a text, whether it was a law code, a pious manual, or a responsive, and in those who were invested with the power of interpreting those texts. Experience, feeling, spirituality should not enter into consideration when assessing the advent of the Messiah. Hal, go ahead, 30 more seconds? Yes. Okay, what I'm trying to say is as follows. When Sefer Hasidim appears in Bologna in 1538, and then again in Krakow, I think it's 1581, but those of you who know will tell me, um, it enters into a, a, a literary world that is foreign from the manuscript world that it, uh, um, it had been in beforehand. So when Sasportas comes to Amsterdam in the 1650s and encounters the Etzheim Library, he doesn't call it a library, he doesn't have a term for a library in the 1650s, but he does encounter a huge number of books, he sees a book, he sees something that is a physical book that he recognizes. And he uses it as, as a weapon, as, as, as a effect, effectively as a textual weapon against a messianic movement that he is trying to fight a rear guard action again. In, in fact, he will use anything that works. And this to me is, is I think, something new that is happening in, uh, to a book like Sefer Hasidim in the 1660s. I have not read. Uh, Joe Scoot's dissertation, which I look forward to reading, uh, and I recognize that there's a lot more work on Sifat Hasidim in the early modern period in the next session, but I thank you for your patience. Questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. It's fascinating, and I'm also, I guess, the 17th century. <laughs> Through it, you know, you have an advantage on us, basically. And um, just a, a question, it seems that it's more than, than a coincidence that these are the three books he uses. And uh, this theme that there is a, a, you know, a common thread between the three, and this is anti-national salvation, anti-Messianic movements. So all three trends, whether it's Maimonides or the Rashba, or uh, or Sefer Hasidim propose an inward salvation, not a natural one. So so it seems more that as picking and choosing the right books than just taking what's ever on the shelf. 
Uh, you're one hundred percent correct. Uh, uh, I don't think I don't I don't think that he lived in the age of Google and sort of like said you know put the word Messiah in and then you know picked out whatever medieval sources. He was a very learned man and he had the rabbinic tradition at his fingertips. So I don't think these sources are random. Um, I will say this. I, I think that it's very important to him to stress that he believes in the Messiah, but he sees absolutely no reason to believe in Shabbat Shalom. Um, he's not willing to give up on the doctrine of the Messiah. This is really crucial, and I think I, I was I, I was I was hoping to avoid mentioning Cholom today, but I can't. Um, I, I think this is something that he's not really giving credit for. He isn't. He believes in the Messiah. He just sees no reason to believe in Shabbat Shalom. So I I don't know that I would call him an anti-nationalist. I, I would like to call him an anti-nationalist for my own ideological purposes, but I don't know that um, that, he, that he believes. He talks about Am Israel all the time. Let me put it that way. Um, but I do agree with you that these three passages are not accidental, and they are inward Yes. I promise not to throw eggs. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a connection that Brian can do this better than me. Better than me, there is a connection between Brian <laughs> and Zebra Chassidim, and that is his teacher, Rabbi Yonah, is not heavily influenced by... So my understanding is there's a huge argument as to whether Rabbi Yonah has no separate Chassidim or not. You tell me. Tell me where to look. I read Tashma's article in the in the Feshrit. Oh, am I missing an article by Professor Panafone? No, both. Oh. I can't keep up with the 80 article. <laughs> Please, after this, if I can write to you and you'll respond, so you can form the academic hierarchy, I will ask you for your article, and I will all like you. Spanish maids, but works like Kaye Olam, the earlier works. And the Rashban knows these. And the Rashban was his direct student, and it's hard to imagine that he doesn't. Does the Rashban quote Sefer Chassidim? As far as I know, he does? Oh, wait, someone's not in. Good question. That, that I don't know, but, but given Rashban's relationship to Rabbi Yonah, it has to be checked. I, I'll, I'll there is this book that Rabbi Yonah is considered the author of, and circulated in Spain as Rabbi Yonah's work. Which is heavily based on Sefer Hasidim. That's the same right there. That's okay, the that's basically. I, 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 so wait, so that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Rashba knew Sefer Hasidim. Yeah, I'm not saying he knew Sefer Hasidim. Okay, I didn't have to cover my rear. Yeah, You're right. 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 Okay. I don't think I'm crazy though. I don't, know. Know. I don't think I'm crazy though to say that the Rashba, Sefer Hasidim, and Maimonides are not exactly the same medieval um, world. It's not as far as you think. That's not right. right. It's not as far. Uh, remember, right. remember that Rashba has complete mastery of anything French and more German than you think. Uh, Ramban, Ramban is the Shimon of the Talmud in one, in one place, both Moshe Taku, Sri Moshe. Right. He's as German as they can. Moshe Taku is the guy that Don published in fact simply, but didn't do it. Right. Moshe yeah. Taku, aside from Hafnamin, was a fairly important Talmud. Yes, no, okay. I just, Ramban, I don't have my map. Okay, you just have to, you just have to. So Thank you. Then I will do my forensic homework more properly next time. Um, Thank you. Another question? <laughs> In that case, thank you very much. And